The past uh, week has been a little bit busy for me um, because of the things that our little friends up in the north have been doing. Uh, that won't be the main subject of my talk this evening. I'm um, happy to take questions on it and discuss that with you. Um, but I'm going to talk uh, more broadly on Asia and on uh, U.S. policy uh, in Asia, if that's okay, if that's okay with everyone. Um, and I, I guess the place to start um, with a discussion like this is with a broader um, uh, uh, scholarly observation. And the broader scholarly observation is that Asia as a region uh, historically has been very peaceful. Um, of course, in the 20th century, we had uh, the war in Vietnam, uh, the war in Korea. Uh, but actually, if you look over the broader expanse of time, uh, relative to other parts of the world, uh, uh, there have been many fewer wars in the Westphalian era in Asia than there have been, for example, uh, in Europe. Um, and in fact, relative um, to Europe, uh, there have been really no major wars of religion. Uh, Europe, you obviously had the Thirty Years' War, but in Asia, um, these have not been the sort of wars that we've, been, that we've seen, in part because the religions, traditions of Asia tend to be more inclusive, more syncretic um, than uh, exclusive religions. <clears throat> and a friend of mine um, who is a professor at USC is now doing this research where he's looking at um, the level of defense spending in Asia. And while uh, these numbers may look impressive over the broader expanse of time. They're actually not that large when you compare them to the rest of the world. So my first point would be that when we look at the region of Asia, contrary to what we think, it's actually a relatively peaceful part of the world um, over, the, over the centuries, over the last four centuries or so. But at the same time, uh, these days, you wouldn't think that. We have um, a uh, islands dispute between the two big powers in Asia, Japan and China, uh, the so-called Senkaku or Daoyutai Islands, um, in which we have almost daily, these days, daily interaction. Not, I mean, not scholarly interaction, but daily uh, political and military interaction over these uh, over these islands, you know, at a pace that really is unprecedented. We haven't really seen this uh, this sort of activity before. Um, uh, between Japan and Korea, the two advanced democracies in Asia, uh, there are also recently a great deal of conflicts and friction over largely two issues: uh, uh, comfort women. And, uh, and also an islands dispute, these two islands that sit between Japan and Korea, uh, Tokdo in Korean, and Takeshima in Japanese. Um, uh, again, we ha we're having sort of disputes over these uh, islands. In fact, I just came back from a trip to uh, Korea and Japan um, uh, to engage in what we call track 1.5 diplomacy uh, where some former U.S. government officials, bipartisan from both the Obama and the Bush administration, we were asked to go to Korea, meet with counterparts in Korea, as well as folks from Japan, to come over for a trilateral meeting, U.S., Japan, Korea. Um, in no small part because there's a desire, the U.S. the U.S. wants to improve relations between Japan and Korea. They don't want to see bad relations between our two main allies in the region. And so I have to tell you, I thought you know, we were very positive about this idea. We thought it would be, a, it would be good. We thought it would be fun. Um, and uh, we were hosted by uh, the, the South Koreans in Seoul. And we arrived, Consul General will know this, we arrived at a place called the Korea National Diplomatic Academy. Uh, the US delegation, the Japanese de delegation, we walked into the room. 
in, into the building. And the first thing you see when you walk into the building is an 80 inch flat panel screen that has a live feed of Tokdo Island, right? The island that is in dispute between the Japanese and Koreans. So as Americans, we walked in and we kind of snickered. We thought, we, we get the message, we understand Tokdo is Korean. For our Japanese colleagues, they just kind of put their head down and shook their heads like this. And so we knew it wasn't going to be a good, a good days of meeting, day of meetings, and, and, and in fact, it wasn't. Um, so you have, you know, these, against this backdrop of a region that relatively, relative to the rest of the world has been fairly peaceful, these days we're seeing these conflicts between China and Japan, over the Senkakus, between Japan and Korea, over Tokdo Island, over historical issues related to textbooks and comfort women. And then, of course, you have North Korea, uh, this regime um, tucked in the center of uh, East Asia that has an, uh, what's the best way to put this, a, an unusual, interesting leadership um, who will not meet with former presidents of the United States, will not meet with the CEO of Google, but will spend a whole day with Dennis Rodman. An NBA basketball, former NBA basketball player. So, and in the meantime, he's, uh, they're doing nuclear tests. Um, they're doing missile tests. Uh, and now they're basically threatening war because they've called off the armistice. So um, the question naturally arises, and it was a, it was a question that I raised in a, an article I wrote uh, for, for foreign policy uh, you know, are we headed for something very different in Asia? Are we headed for more problems than peace in Asia? Um, I hate to disappoint you, but the answer is I don't know. <laughs> but what I can say is that there have been other times in history that we thought Asia was headed for trouble. Uh, in fact, at the end of the Cold War, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, there was a, a, a large body of writing done by prominent scholars of international relations uh, that essentially predicted that this region of Asia would be, uh, I think that the phrase that I used in the foreign policy article and the phrase that's often used is, Asia would be ripe for rivalry. That uh, after the end of the Cold War conflict, the next major region of competition and uh, security attention uh, would be Asia. And uh, back then there were three reasons why people said that that would be the case. And there are three reasons that seem to uh, 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 have some resonance today. The first was the rise of China. And in particular, at, at this period in the early 1990s, it was the concern about Chinese economic growth. Uh, and it was not because China was a communist country, but simply the fact that it was a country that was growing at uh, double-digit rates. And for many IR scholars, they basically see, when they see a country that is growing at double-digit economic rates, growth rates, those periods of double-digit economic growth are usually um, correlated with expansionist foreign policy. Uh, and that was the case not just that that was the case not just for China, it was the case for Imperial Japan, it's a case for Germany, Russia, Great Britain, the United States, basically any country that you can think of that was a rising power. Uh, so one of the concerns with, was that the rise of China, the, the economic growth of China would lead to expanded military <laughs> ambitions. Uh, the other variable was the normalization of Japan that essentially with the end of the Cold War, uh, that Japan would, uh, would shed its Cold War identity as a country that was an economic power, but was uh, in security terms quite small, and that it would normalize its uh, political military profile. Uh, and that this would then create all sorts of security dilemmas in the region, because everybody would get concerned that Japan was coming back and Pre -war, we'd see sort of the uh, resuscitation of pre-war Japan and all this sort of stuff. Um, and then the third variable that people focused on was the United States. 
And the concern at this time was that at a time when you have a rising China, a normalizing Japan, uh, we would see post-Cold War U.S. withdrawal from Asia. That essentially there would be a mandate for the United States no longer to be uh, expending sort of resources and presence in Asia, and that it was structurally ordained that the United States would be pulling back from Asia just as all of these dynamics were starting to heat up in the, in the, in the region. So for this reason, many uh, very famous international relations scholars predicted that there would be conflict in Asia. Um, and this, so this was about 1991, 1992. And when I was teaching at Georgetown courses on international relations and East Asian security, I was teaching all of these theories and arguments about, uh, about how this uh, Asia would be ripe for rivalry. So five years passed, you know, it was 1997 then, and I was still teaching these theories, and students would raise their hand and they'd say, but Professor Cha, this was written five years ago, and there's still no conflict. So what's the statute of limitations on these predictions? <laughs> and I said, just wait, let's wait and see. So 10 years passed, it's 2002, and there's still no conflict in Asia. And by this time, the students are kind of they're, they're reading all this stuff, but they're not in the mind at all to absorb it. They just want to criticize it because they think, it, they think it's all wrong. Um, and then 2004, uh, uh, I leave. I go, I go to the White House, uh, spend three years there, and come back. And then I come back to teach these students again. And they still say there's still no conflict, and we're now 15 years past when these papers were written. So maybe they're wrong. Right? Maybe they're wrong. Um, in any event, I think what uh, recent events have shown, so I guess the point here is it's a debate. There is always a debate about, about uh, uh, this whole question of Asia and stability, uh, and it continues to be a debate. But I think the upshot of this discussion is that recent events show uh, that Asia will be a major challenge and a major priority for the United States um, and for uh, the Obama administration in its second term. Um, um, as uh, uh, National Security Advisor Donilon said the other night, uh, within the next five years, 50% of global growth outside of the United States will take place in Asia. Uh, and this growth is also fueling uh, China's rise as a global power it is fueling uh, Japan's return, if you will. Uh, we actually hosted at CSIS, we hosted Japanese Prime Minister Abe um, after his visit to the White House a couple of weeks ago. And he came and gave a speech in a session similar to this, where he said, uh, uh, most of his speech was uh, in Japanese, but he said in English, Japan is back. Right? Japan is back uh, after the uh, period of um, directionless political leadership and then, of course, the disaster, uh, the March 11th disaster, that Japan is now back. Uh, this growth is also fueling a global Korea, a Korea that is really reaching beyond simply the peninsula and has become a major player on the global stage, whether it is hosting the G20 summit, uh, hosting the nuclear security summit, uh, chairing the United Nations Security Council, or even hosting the Winter Olympics in 2018. Um, so I think it's appropriate that with all that is going on in Asia that the president has pivoted uh, to Asia. Uh, and let me just uh, quote for you from um, Tom Donilon's speech, yes, uh, I think it was yesterday, the day before yesterday, where he talked about uh, the, the concept of this so-called pivot or rebalance to Asia. He said, um, quote, it was the president's judgment that we were overweighted in some areas and regions, uh, uh, including our military actions in the Middle East. At the same time, we were underweighted in other regions, such as the Asia Pacific. Uh, indeed, we believed this was our key geographic imbalance. Our guiding insight 
was that Asia's future and the future of the United States are deeply linked. And when it comes to the Asia Pacific, the United States is, quote, all in, close quote. Um, now, I think this is a very powerful statement of the U.S. position in Asia and its commitment um, to remain an Asia-Pacific power. And I congratulate uh, the administration for doing that. Uh, but I think what is interesting when we look at the evolution of U.S. policy to Asia uh, over the past five years or so, um, in many ways, if you had told me in 2009 that this is where the United States would be on Asia, I never would have believed you. Never would have believed, if, if you had told me that the United States will have pivoted to Asia, it will be the main area of focus for the future, uh, I never would have believed you. Uh, and the reason that is, is because I think that the Asia that um, President Obama expected uh, in 2009 was not the Asia that he got. Now I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment, but uh, let me, before I do that, let me just offer first a disclaimer. Um, so I worked for President Bush um, in the White House in his second term, and I worked there as a expert, uh, not as a uh, political person, I was not a political appointee, I was an expert that was asked to come in and work on Asia. I didn't work on anyone's campaign, anything like that. So um, uh, I, if I talk about U.S. policy to Asia today, you should see where I'm coming from. It's not from the perspective of some sort of partisan bickering inside of Washington. Uh, it's approaching it from the view of, a, of an academic, a scholar. Um, uh, I. Uh, did not uh, vote for President Obama, but at the same time I went to college with him. Uh, we were a class of 1983 at Columbia College. He was a transfer student from Occidental College in uh, California. Uh, we used to argue over budgets uh, in the Student Activity Center. Uh, I was uh, involved with Asian Student Union. He was involved with Black Students Organization. We used to complain that black students organization got more money than Asian Student Union. They used to look at us like we were crazy and said, You're an, we're an Ivy League university in Harlem. What do you expect? Right? Uh, uh, we said, it's still unfair. They said, well, go to NYU, right? Uh, NYU in Chinatown, I'm sure Asian Student Union got more money than, uh, than anyway. Um, so he's done a little bit better than I have in terms of his career. Uh, but I don't hold that against him, and uh, and uh, and so I want you know I'm, I, I applaud the pivot to Asia. But to me, what's so interesting about uh, U.S. policy to Asia today, uh, and what is going on, is that I never would have expected this uh, us to be where we are on Asia today. Um, and let me explain why. Um, <clears throat> uh, when the Obama administration started its first term. Uh, I think it had a certain roadmap for how it wanted, wanted to approach Asia. Um, and it's, it wasn't necessarily one that I disagreed with, but there was uh, sort of a clear set of assumptions that were coming into place as the new administration started. Uh, the first of these was on China. And essentially the idea here was that the United States was going to take the U.S.-China relationship to the next level. What do we mean by the next level? Uh, prior to this, the operating template for U.S.-China relations was something called responsible stakeholder. It was an idea that was conceived of by Robert Zellick, who was then Deputy Secretary of State. And essentially the idea was that a, as China rises in the international system, it needs to be more of a responsible stakeholder in global affairs. It needs to use its growing power to contribute to the public goods of the international system. Environment, counterproliferation, human rights, rule of law, responsible overseas development assistance, all of these sorts of things. And like I said, this was an idea that was um, uh, uh, conceived of by uh, uh, Robert Zellick. 
And I traveled with um, Secretary Rice when she um, uh, rev um, discussed these ideas with China. Uh, and the Chinese were very receptive to it. I mean, they liked the idea. Well, first they said, first when the, we explained this to them, they stopped and they said, well, thank you. We think of ourselves as a responsible stakeholder and a great power as well. They were patting themselves on the back. And we had to stop them and say, no, 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 wait, you're misunderstanding. You're not yet a responsible stakeholder. You have to become a responsible stakeholder in the international system. Uh, but at any rate, um, they really latched on to the idea, and it became the template for U.S.-China relations uh, through 2008. Um, from 2009, the idea was to take this to a new level, which was to essentially say that China, you are now a global power, and the United States will work with you um, to uh, solve a lot of problems in the world today. Uh, this is what journalists started to call the G2, the group of two, uh, the G2 concept. Um, and it be very, became very clear that this was the template uh, when President Obama made his first speech on Asia in November 2009 in Japan, uh, where in Suntory Hall, which was not nearly as nice as this hall, he said, um, uh, China is central to the U.S. global agenda. China is central to the U.S. global agenda. Right? So it was really a vision of the U.S. and China attached at the hip, trying to solve a lot of problems around the world. Responsible stakeholder taken to the next level. Japan. Um, uh, here I think the simplest way to describe it is that the desire was the U.S.-Japan relationship should continue to be the cornerstone of the U.S. position in Asia. Japan has, for 50 years, been the key U.S. ally in Asia. It is both the beginning and the end of U.S. policy in Asia. Any new initiative in Asia starts with Japan. It ends with Japan. And the idea was, as the United States reaches out to try to engage China uh, in a constructive partnership, this would be based in and anchored in very strong alliance with Japan. Again, how do we know this? Uh, Secretary Clinton's uh, first trip, overseas trip, as Secretary of State uh, was to Japan. Uh, and the first visitor to the Obama White House uh, was uh, for, uh, Prime Minister Aso, Taro Aso. So again, a very clear view that as you reach out to China, we remain very tightly allied with Japan. Uh, then there was North Korea, and here um, the administration, to its credit, uh, said that it, it reviewed the negotiating record uh, with the North Koreans. They called us in, asked us to talk about what it was like to negotiate with them. We said, it's very painful, right? it takes a long time, you need a lot of patience, and they said, fine, we understand that. Uh, but they said the one thing that we're going to do differently is that we are going to engage uh, bilaterally with the North Koreans. Uh, I think probably President Bush became most famous for his unwillingness uh, to engage in one-to-one -one talks with the North Koreans, in part because he really didn't like the North Korean leader. Um, and it was the succeeding administration's view that the agreements that were reached <coughs> in 2005 and 2007 <clears throat> were good agreements, but that we could take them even further if we complemented the multilateral negotiating process with a separate U.S. DPRK high-level bilateral negotiation. How do we know this? Um, the United States <clears throat> had, I think, 16 special envoys uh, for problems around the world. Uh, Richard Holbrook, uh, for AFPAC, um, uh, George Mitchell, uh, um, and several others. Uh, four out of the 16 envoys, right, four out of the 16 were for North Korea. Again, a special envoy for North Korea, uh, Stephen Bosworth, uh, a special envoy for six party talks, a special envoy for uh, UN sanctions, 
and a special envoy for human rights. So, f you know, North Korea is not a big country, but four out of the 16 envoys were for Korea. <coughs> and, and through his special envoy, um, uh, the president made very clear in, in writing his willingness uh, to, uh, to engage with, to um, uh, reach out to the North Koreans to have some sort of dialogue. And then the fourth element of the policy or the strategy, I would say, for the United States at the time had to do with trade. Uh, and here, essentially, the inclination was not to talk about trade. Uh, there were a number of outstanding free trade agreements that had not yet been ratified by the Congress. Uh, and the view was, let us leave these alone, let's not move forward with these, let's basically call a timeout. Um, how do we know this? Um, in, in the first year of the administration, uh, there were only two trade acts that were taken in the first year of the administration, and both of them were uh, punitive tariffs uh, against China for uh, steel pipes and for tires. So on trade, basically a timeout. So this, these were sort of the four elements of U.S. strategy towards Asia going into uh, 2008, 2009. And so what happened? Uh, a lot. A lot happened that changed, uh, dramatically changed the situation. On China, um, the, uh, this idea of investing in a partnership with China that was to yield uh, benefits uh, in terms of the U.S. global agenda just didn't come to pass. One very big area was climate change, and at the summit in Copenhagen, uh, the Chinese just did not deliver. I mean, there was an agreement at Copenhagen, but it was not one that really lived up to U.S. expectations. Um, and so uh, this investment in this G2 partnership uh, did not appear to be working. On top of that, um, when the president made his first trip to China in November of 2009, um, he wasn't very happy with it. Uh, first of all, it, it was not around vacation, so he couldn't take his family with him. Uh, he didn't want to do sightseeing, but because he's a very sort of hardworking uh, fellow, they said, no, no, the Chinese said, no, you have to visit the Great Wall. You have to visit the Great Wall. So there's this famous picture, I don't know if you've seen it, of President Obama out on the Great Wall. He's wearing a, a, a black trench coat, he's got his hands in his pockets, and he's sort of standing on the Great Wall and kind of looking around. And, uh, and this is a picture that was distributed all over the world, and when you saw the picture, you thought, this, I thought, this was exactly the picture that the Chinese wanted. Sort of a young, inexperienced president um, presiding over a financially hollowed out country, standing in awe of thousands of years of Chinese civilization, right? This was the picture that they, they wanted. But anyway, there were a number of things that didn't go well uh, in this trip, such that uh, when he left, he didn't have very good feeling about, uh, about the relationship. In Japan, of course, there was a lot of change. In Japan, we saw domestic politics create probably the biggest strategic shock for the United States in recent history in Japan, which was the ouster of 60 years of conservative LDP rule uh, and the uh, ascension to power of the progressives, the opposition party um, in, in Japan that, that decided it was going to define its new identity, uh, not by policies, but by their opposition to the United States on many of the agreements that had been reached by the previous governments. And so this was a big shock. I mean, for, you know, the United States has always relied on Japan as the foundation in Asia, and all of a sudden you were dealing with a completely different partner. Uh, Japan pulled out uh, marine self-defense forces from the Indian Ocean that were helping to fuel uh, troops in Afghanistan. Uh, they called timeout on a big base realignment deal uh, moving Marines out of Okinawa, you know, a whole succe a succession of things that really 
shocked uh, the United States into understanding it's going to be a completely different relationship. Uh, and then, of course, 311, March 11th, the triple disaster, the tsunami, uh, I'm sorry, the earthquake, the tsunami, and then the meltdown in Fukushima essentially effectively took Japan off the map uh, as all of its energies were concentrated inwards in terms of trying to rebuild the country. So if you think about the United States and one of the key foundations of its strategy in Asia has always been the strong and dependable alliance with Japan. This was gone. All of a sudden, that leg of the stool was pulled out. Uh, North Korea. Uh, uh, the United States reached out uh, on several occasions, called for uh, better relations with the country, with the country, a desire for um, uh, returning to the agreements of 2005 and 2007. Uh, and how did the North Koreans respond? Uh, in April of 2009, they did a ballistic missile test. Uh, in May of 2009, they did their second nuclear test. Uh, May of 2009, on Memorial Day, they did their second nuclear test. Uh, and then in 2010, they sank a South Korean ship, killing 46 sailors. Uh, and then shortly after that, they started firing artillery on a South Korean island. Firing artillery on a South Korean island. Uh, and then following that, um, they did uh, more missile tests. And of course, just last month, they did their third nuclear test. So this whole idea of reaching out to North Korea just didn't work. Right? And then on trade, um, uh, President Obama makes his first trip to Asia in November of 2009 for APEC, uh, which was taking place in Singapore. APEC countries make up 46% of global trade. Um, and uh, I'm sure some of you here who've served in government know in these big multilateral meetings like APEC, uh, one of the, uh, you, you have the big multilateral meeting, but there's a lot of business that gets transacted on the side uh, we call these uh, side bilats. They're basically small mini bilateral summits that take place on the side of the main, of the main uh, um, uh, event. And in the run-up to these things, um, you'll have different countries that will ask, you know, we'd like uh, bilateral with you to discuss this, that, and the other thing. So you can imagine this was President Obama's first trip to Asia. Everybody wanted a bilateral meeting. I mean, everybody wanted a bilateral meeting with him. And, uh, uh, and the decision was made to only do them with um, the ASEAN countries that uh, and, and Singapore was hosting, so the Southeast Asian countries, uh, China, of course, uh, and a couple of others. And uh, in every meeting with uh, these Asian leaders, you can sort of imagine, I mean, this guy was a rock star, right? So every Asian leader walked into the room, and it was like, your kids or your grandkids at a Justin Bieber concert, right? They're like, President Obama, you know, you, you are everything that we love about America, right? You, you, everything you stand for, we love everything about you about America. We like you so much better than the last guy. Uh, so they said all these wonderful platitudes, but they did ask one question. And they said the one question is, um, what is your trade policy? because you've gone 11 months uh, and you've said nothing about trade. And half of the United States position in Asia, half of it is the security stabilizing presence, but the other half is to be the upholder of an open trading order in the region. And because the United States was absent for 11 months, this was a real concern. Uh, uh, there were many in Asia who believed the United States was becoming protectionist because of our own problems, economic problems here at home. So all of these things, uh, again, uh, speaks to the point that the Asia that they expected was not the Asia that they got. Now, every administration, every presidency's medal is tested not by the strategy they bring into office, but how they adjust to the things they don't expect. That is really how you can define a presidency. So clearly, when I was going for President Bush, you know, it was 
right? 9-11 was not expected, but he came to define every day of his presidency after that. Uh, so, and a lot of it is how you adjust. And so given uh, the major curveballs that Asia threw at the, at the Obama administration, I think they adjusted pretty well. Right? In terms of China, uh, they, they took the relationship for what it was, which is a combination of both cooperation uh, as well as competition. In Japan, uh, the triple disaster ended up being something that brought the United States and Japan closer together. Uh, you know, in times of need, that's when your allies really show up. And in this case, the United States really did show up uh, to help Japan. Uh, and, and, uh, and today, you know, as Prime Minister Abe said, Japan is back. Uh, on North Korea, the effort was to try to engage, but if the North Koreans were not willing, uh, we have seen a very robust sanctions regime that is UN, UN backed, uh, probably the strongest set of sanctions that we've seen on the country uh, in, in decades. And on trade, uh, we're now at a point where perhaps the most important institution that the United States over the next four years could leave or build in Asia is on trade. Uh, and that is something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. You know, first, uh, first was CORUS, the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement, which was ratified a year ago. In fact, today, this month, we are celebrating the one-year anniversary of the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement. The uh, single largest uh, bilateral free trade agreement ever negotiated by the United States. Uh, the largest free trade agreement negotiated by the United States since NAFTA. Um, and, uh, and really a, a prototypical free trade agreement uh, in the sense that it is high quality and a very deep and broad agreement and is actually the template for uh, this, uh, this broader Trans-Pacific Partnership, the so-called TPP, uh, which involves a whole set of countries in Asia and could become the most important uh, effort at trying to build a free trade area of the Asia Pacific. And again, this is from a president that started out not wanting to do trade. So overall, I think the record has been, um, uh, although it's had its difficulties, has been pretty good. Uh, the pivot to Asia is something that I think is smart. It is in the interests of the United States. Uh, but undeniably, there are challenges ahead. And uh, one of them is, of course, the Japan-China relationship uh, and how to keep these two uh, major powers uh, from engaging in anything that could become uh, escalatory. And then the other, of course, is North Korea. And uh, uh, how do we stop um, basically a runaway nuclear weapon state from destabilizing uh, the region. Um, but as I said, all the predictions of Asia being ripe for rivalry in the past have been wrong. Um, and uh, one hopes that they'll be wrong again. Uh, but I think as long as the United States remains focused on Asia, considers it one of its priorities, uh, then I think it will be a very important stabilizing influence in the region uh, that will allow everyone to benefit from the, the growth and the trade uh, that is taking place in that part of the world. Uh, so I believe I've spoken for longer than I should have, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I was at Georgetown in 1990 and I remember learning the com Communist Party structure and for a test and then like it was, they were like, never mind, we're not even going to have the test anymore. <laughs> um, and so there was a lot of talk about mutual assured destruction being the deterrent. Do you think that's the case with us with North Korea? That's my first question. And my second question is again, yeah. To what extent do you think that the Chinese will either openly or quietly um, try to put um, some control on what happens with the rhetoric that's going on? Um, uh, yeah, in 1990, I was in grad school at Columbia. And uh, I, I remember uh, both our professors and my colleagues, well, my colleagues who were 
PhD candidates doing Soviet studies, training to be Soviet specialists, were kind of walking around with their hands in their pockets, staring at the ground, because they were trying to figure out what they were going to retool as. Uh, and the professors were basically just reading the newspaper. That was their research, reading what was happening every day uh, in the newspaper. I'll never forget that. Uh, but some things never change, like North Korea, right? And in this case, on the first question about deterrence, um, yes, I think it's fair to say that uh, during the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union were mutually deterred. Uh, and in that sense, uh, while there were thousands of nuclear warheads on each side, there was a stability there, right? Uh, in the sense that neither side knew that they could wipe out the other side uh, and they could get themselves quite hurt in the process of trying to do so. The danger, I think, with North Korea is that I don't think that sort of deterrence holds. In fact, the most dangerous time in you know, when you're trying to achieve some sort of stable deterrence, the most dangerous time is when you have a newly weaponizing state. Because if you have 500 nuclear warheads, there's a pretty good chance there's going to be stable deterrence because no matter what you do to try to kill me, I still may be able to get a shot off, right? And that'll be enough to deter you. But if you're like North Korea and you have a handful of nuclear weapons, that's a very destabilizing situation for two reasons. One is um, when you have that sort of situation, I'm not saying this is anybody's policy, but it leaves open the possibility of preemption. If, if the other side only has a few weapons and you think you have a chance of getting them all, then that creates an incentive to preempt. It's not stable. Secondly, if you're North Korea, you get into some sort of crisis that's escalating and you only have five or six weapons and you're worried that the other side can take out your five or six weapons, as the crisis is escalating, that's, that creates what's called a use or lose incentive. You gotta get them off before someone tries to preempt you. Very unstable situation. That's what we're in with North Korea right now, a very unstable situation because they don't have second strike capability. Uh, they have a, you know, a fledgling um, nuclear deterrent uh, that creates all sorts of destabilizing ripple effects. Uh, on China, I mean, we, you know, how, we can talk about this all night. I mean, China, uh, China does not love North Korea, right? China does not believe North Korea is its little communist brother that it must protect, right? China despises North Korea. It is an albatross around its neck. Every time the North Koreans do something bad, it's like throwing mud on, China, on the Chinese face. Because when the North Koreans do something bad, everybody blames China. Why don't you stop them? Why don't you do something about this? Um, so they despise the North Koreans, but at the same time, they're the only North Koreans that they got <laughs> because if they allow North Korea to collapse, then what do they get? They get a democratic South Korea that's a military ally of the United States right on their border. Uh, they don't want that. Right? So, um, so they're caught between a rock and a hard place. Uh, on the one hand, they really do want to try to influence, I think, they want to try to influence North Korean behavior in a good direction. But at the same time, they don't want to um, squeeze the North Koreans too hard because that could start to unravel the regime. And if that were to happen, they have no idea what to do. Nobody would know what to do at that point. So um, this is always the dilemma that China faces with North Korea, and I think it faces it today as it tries to implement these sanctions that were just uh, passed uh, a couple of days ago. Um, now I can see, I know that your specialty is in obviously uh, East Asia or Asia Pacific, but I am curious about um, what are your thoughts concerning the rest of the continent of Asia, in particular uh, the other great powers, the billion power plus of um, India and uh, Russia, and also 
uh, you know, for 2,500 years, it's always played a role in Asia. I mean, I don't think that in the 21st century it's just going to fade away just because America wants it to, but also Iran, uh, you know, as reasserting itself within the Asian mainland and above. Uh, what are your thoughts about the rest of those countries? That's a big question. <laughs> oh, I know. Um, let me just take two pieces of that. On India, um, you know, I think the, the, if we're sort of taking the big strategic look here, you know, I think the relationship that we have to watch very carefully in the future is the Sino-Indian relationship. Uh, clearly, the two big powers in the region, uh, China is looking west more and more these days. Um, and the dynamic, if you look at it, is, for, you know, as an international relations scholar, when you look at the dynamic there, it doesn't look good. Because outside of North Korea, right, China's only real alliance relationship that looks like alliance relationship is with Pakistan. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you know, we're trying to transform our relationship with India, willing to sell them all sorts of weaponry. Uh, you know, this is not a good combination, right? Uh, it, it creates security dilemmas, this, this sort of thing. In addition, um, unlike Southeast Asia, South Asia is a region that is not very heavy on regional institutions, right? Often if you have regional institutions, they can help to buffer some of this competition that takes place. Uh, and uh, relatively speaking, there aren't a lot of regional institutions um, in, uh, in that part of the world. So that's, uh, that's one relationship I think one has to watch very carefully. Now, the, both the Chinese and the Indians know that they don't want to get into a conflict and they've tried to create different groups um, to improve relations, but they're there's so many different dynamics here. It's not just the military competition, there's water competition in that part of the world, all sorts of different things that make this a very interesting region to watch. And then going further west, Iran, um, um, uh, the sort of China-Middle East relationship is something that I think there's growing interest in. There's obviously interest in China because of the energy resources. But one of the things that I've noticed, I run a, a graduate program on Asia at Georgetown, and one of the things that I've noticed in our applicant pool is that we are actually, I mean, we get sort of traditional pool of folks from the Northeastern colleges, from the West Coast, uh, from some of the big uh, state universities in the Midwest, um, um, uh, from Asia, but what we are seeing now in our applicant pool is more and more people actually from the Middle East that are fluent in Chinese, ethnically, you know, from the Middle East, that are fluent in Chinese. Uh, and th so this is another growing area of, of interaction that is, again, it's largely unstructured, which, is, which makes it both interesting to study, but also as a policymaker, something you have to watch very carefully. Uh, because there aren't established rules of the road or institutions that define how interaction should take place. Victor, I had a question. Uh, China, in addition, uh, has a domestic problem with North Korea, do they not? Uh, where uh, if North Korea is squeezed economically, more and more North Koreans manage to cross the border and live in China and create a welfare problem. So how do they balance their uh, domestic problems with North Korea versus the application of sanctions? Yeah, that, that's a, it's a good question. Um, there is, in China, a large ethnic minority of Koreans who live in China, largely in Jilin province. Um, it's the largest uh, overseas uh, ethnic Korean population outside of Korea, uh, by far, by double. Um, and the Sino-North Korean border is fairly porous. Uh, there are parts of the Yalu River where you can just wade across. And uh, in the past years, there's been a large economic migrant population because there's no food right that, that goes across China, tries to make money, and come, come back. Uh, but over the years, more and more of them want to stay in China. They don't want to come back. And so for the Chinese, this is a real concern. Uh, they're estimated that there would be two million, at least two million refugees that would cross the border into China if there were instability in North Korea, if there were a breakdown in political order. Uh, they can really only go in one direction. They can only go north. Uh, 
They can't go south. If they went south, they'd probably be shot uh, because there's a de military demarcation line, a DMZ there. So most of them would go north. And for the Chinese, this could be uh, very destabilizing. Um, they benefit from, uh, economically, the Jilin province, Liaoning province benefit from North Korea in the sense that the Chinese are in there extracting a lot of minerals. The northern part of the Korean Peninsula is actually quite mineral rich. The southern part of the peninsula is the breadbasket. But the northern part, actually, there's a lot of uh, iron ore, copper, nickel. Uh, some people think there are even a lot of rare earths up there. And so the Chinese have been taking all that stuff out right, uh, for its two inland provinces, which are poorer than the coastal provinces. Uh, so they're benefiting from that, but uh, the last thing they would like to see is a collapse where you get millions of refugees coming over. And it's not just the economic impact, it's, it's the health impact. Um, you know, the, this is a population that's malnourished. Uh, uh, Andrew Natsios, who's a friend and uh, teaches here in Texas, he, um, uh, he, he uh, was former director of USAID, says, you know, malnourished populations have low resistance to disease, so they carry a lot of disease with them. And so the Chinese are deathly afraid of all these people coming across and bringing TB and all these other diseases with them. Hi, um, how much would you say that these territorial disputes over these islands are really about energy, potential energy resources there? And will that only be exacerbated as demand for energy rose in, in Asia? Um, I think to an extent they are about um, EEZs and, and uh, continental shelves and uh, proprietary rights over energy. Uh, but I think a lot of it these days is about um, nationalism and also a sense that in both China and Japan's case, uh, they're on the rise. Um, and, uh, and for this reason, you know, sort of material stuff always drives some of this behavior, but um, when it gets to a certain level, a lot of it becomes political. And I think these islands have become a way for both sides to vent nationalism in a way that is politically safe for them. Uh, you know, China, uh, has to be very careful about nationalism because uh, you know when they try when when you you encourage nationalism it can go in all sorts of directions one day it could be directed against the Japanese the next day it could be directed against the government um, and so I think that they have found these islands to be a good way to sort of legitimize the party right legitimize uh, uh, the leadership and allow a venting of nationalism in a way that's relatively safe. In the same case in Japan, I mean, in, in Japan, you start talking about nationalism, it, gets, it creates all sorts of concerns about sort of the renewal of Japanese militarism and stuff. And, and this becomes a very safe way to vent, uh, vent nationalism. So, you know, there's never one cause for these things. It's always a confluence of them. But I think the dynamic we're seeing today really is more of a political military one than it being driven uh, by uh, energy. This is a uh, two-part question. First one is, does North Korea fear China or should it? And second, could you comment on the amount of money and time China is spending in uh, Africa? Um, does, <clears throat> does North Korea fear China? Um, well, I, you know, I, I a moment ago, I talked about the Chinese side of the equation, which is that the Chinese despise the North Koreans. I think the North Koreans despise the Chinese, too. Uh, the Chinese treat them like dirt. Right? Uh, they basically uh, treat them like a poor province. Um, uh, but they're the only Chinese that they got, right? <laughs> they don't have anybody else. Uh, and, um, and so uh, I think... Uh, they, they almost, I mean, some, it seems like they almost dare the Chinese to drop them. You know, they just, I mean, they did this nuclear test on Chinese New Year's, 
And uh, I have to tell you, when I was at Six Party Talks, um, Chinese were great hosts, forever patient. Uh, we would be in negotiations the week before Christmas. And, uh, and these things would go on and on and on. And uh, our Chinese hosts would say, well, it looks like we're going to carry into the following week. And we, being the American delegation, said, no way. We're going home. It's Christmas. You know, we are, we're stopping tomorrow, and that's it. And you tell the North Koreans we're stopping tomorrow. And the Chinese would say, be patient. You have to be, you Americans are so, you're always in a rush, right? Be patient. Well, one time we had a round of six party talks in February. And uh, it was the February, the week before the Chinese New Year. And so the North Koreans were being North Koreans again. And, you know, we're waiting and waiting and waiting. And so we said to our Chinese host, well, it looks like we're going to have to go into next week. And the only time I saw the Chinese lose their cool was then, because they said, no, there's no way we're going into next week. And we were, I mean, we were kind of joking around. We said, why? It's just Valentine's Day, right? It's not, it's just, you know, they said, no, absolutely not. So the fact that they did this test during Chinese New Year's, when all of these officials had to come back from vacation, is really a slap in the face. And it's like they're almost daring the Chinese to drop them. But they know that for China, um, uh, you know, these are the only North Koreans that they got, and they can't allow the regime to collapse. So I think that's a way of saying that they, I don't think they do fear the Chinese. Um, uh, I'm sorry, and your second question was? Oh, China, Africa, right. Um, uh, well, one of the big issues in the U.S.-China relationship uh, uh, over the past uh, eight years has been their overseas development assistance policies in Africa, which have been um, sort of in complete violation of the norms, uh, at least of the way we do overseas development assistance. Um, I think where we saw this really come to head was in 2008, with all the protests over um, Chinese policies in Darfur during, at the time of the Olympics, where uh, movie stars and others were leveraging the Olympics as a way to put pressure on China. And I think it led to some changes in Chinese policies at the time uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, getting acceptance of the Kofi Annan plan and some other, some other sorts of things. But my understanding is that since then, um, there hasn't really been much improvement. So uh, uh, it's very transactional, right? Uh, I mean, they will provide assistance, build, build uh, trophy buildings, build stadiums, uh, regardless of the domestic situation in the country uh, in return for um, access to resources. And, uh, and I think part of the whole responsible stakeholder template was to say that that's not a good way to do uh, assistance policy, uh, but um, uh, there doesn't look like there's much change right now. I'm going to stay with China for the moment. Um, there's a lot of issues where we would like to see change from China regarding um, pollution, uh, piracy, and uh, cyber attacks that we've been hearing about recently, and yet we want to develop a um, trade partnership with them, yet there's still the reality of the strategic um, competition, and how do we balance that? Well, it's a good question. I think it's one that policymakers wrestle with every day when it comes to the relationship with China. Um, <clears throat> This is not the U.S.-Soviet relationship. Uh, the United States and the Soviet Union were not as economically interdependent as the U.S. and China are. Um, I think um, Secretary, Secretary, or President Obama himself said it very clearly. He said there, there is no country in the world today that has more at stake in U.S. financial recovery than China. At the same time, there is no country in the world today that has a greater stake in China's peaceful rise than the United States, right? So it is, you know, for two, you know, for a dominant power and a rising power in the international system, this is fairly unique historically in terms of the relationship. And so it's constantly a balance all the time. Uh, 
you know, on the one hand, um, President Obama talks about the National Export Initiative doubling U.S. exports to create more jobs. Uh, you know, a lot of that is going to come from exports to China. Uh, but at the same time, you know, one of the biggest threats we face today is hacking, right? Uh, and a lot of it is coming from China. Um, so it's just one of these relationships that will forever be a combination of competition and cooperation. And in the broader scheme of things, I think the idea is that China will rise, it will become a major power in the international system, but how can we shape that rise in a way that um, persuades China to accept the system that they're living in rather than to try to completely overturn it? Uh, John Eikenberry, a colleague of mine at Princeton, says, you know, you have to po po pose choices to China where they see it as being cheaper to live within the current system and more expensive to try to overturn it. Um, and, you know, and I think that's the big project, you know, with, uh, uh, with, with China over the, next, over the next generation. Just to give you an example of this, um, uh, so I traveled with the Georgetown basketball team to China uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and the idea was people-to-people -people exchange, um, uh, in particular try to enhance people-to-people uh, -people ties with the PLA, the Chinese military, because no one had a really good sense of what the Chinese military was doing and how it was connected to the party and everything. So uh, the Georgetown basketball team went, we played four exhibition games there. Uh, the administration was very happy that we were doing this, and they particularly liked that we were playing one game against the PLA's team, right? the People's Liberation Army professional basketball team, all in the spirit of cooperation. Um, now, some of you may have remembered how that game ended. There was a huge fight, right? <laughs> a huge fight. Uh, and, uh, and so we spent the whole night trying to resolve this and, you know, because... Vice President Biden was in China at the same time. In fact, I had to call his party to tell them what was going on because he came to the game the night before. Um, and, uh, but when we were interacting with them, they said, you know, the embassy and everybody, they said, you know, welcome to our world, right? This is our life dealing with China. You, you know, you, you want to start out something to be cooperative and then all of a sudden it becomes competitive and this is just our world now. Time for one last question. Okay. Maybe just following on from that, we were in Hong Kong uh, a year ago, February, for the opening of the new Asia Society facility there, which is almost as nice as this one, but this is obviously <laughs> better, and we're very proud of this one. They had to use an old building to kind of renovate that, and we, of course, built a modern new building, which is beautiful. Uh, but there was a panel of very distinguished uh, uh, ex-political people, and, and there was a Korean on the panel, there was a, a woman from China, there was a very senior ex-diplomat from the United States. And one of the panelists, uh, following up from that last question, suggested, maybe it was more an intellectual suggestion, that the challenge for China and the United States over time is that the relationship will be a zero-sum game. That China's rise must, by definition, result in the United States decline. And that there was no way for them to both rise together. And I had not heard that theory before, certainly not as clearly as stated as that. And is that indeed a, a just a theory, or is it actually a view espoused by people in the uh, political world that is something we need to worry about? Well, it's a good question. The, um, I mean, the history of international relations would lend one to believe that that's the case. Uh, historically, we have seen dominant powers fall at the expense of the rise of others, right? Uh, sometimes through war, sometimes through uh, less than war, but that has been the story. Um, and this is why I think this whole concept of responsible stakeholder is a good template uh, because it's essentially trying to put forward the view that China's rise is not necessarily a zero-sum game. When we, again, when this idea was first put to the Chinese at first, they were not sure what it meant. They had, the first thing they asked was, how do you write the character in Chinese? Because they'd never heard this term before. Um, and then uh, they came back a couple of days later and they were asking lots of questions about it. And when I was thinking about it, I thought, uh, 
So there are two reasons why I think they like this idea. The first is um, it was the first statement of a U.S. strategy for China that explicitly acknowledged China's place in the world as a soon-to-be great power. And so that was very important for China to hear that from the United States. But the other was that it was essentially saying that if, as China rises, if it contributes to the public goods of the international system, plays by the rules, that's in U.S. interest as well. And that is a non-zero-sum view of, uh, of a U.S.-China relationship. Um, and so, you know, I think that if, uh, you know, if, if um, President Obama or someone were to ask me today, what's the template for U.S.-China relations? I would say that it's still that, that um, uh, we have to create a, an environment, a framework in which China sees it as its responsibility uh, to play by the rules and contribute to these things we call public goods in the international system because uh, that will only reinforce its rise and its reputation. Because um, uh, there's really no other way. Right? Um, and the other way is not a good way. Right? So, and I don't think it's any, anybody's interest uh, to, to see that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it turned out to be a zero-sum game with the Soviet Union. And uh, I get there are some people that think China will grow old and will fall apart before it grows strong um, uh, because of income disparities, coastal, inland province disparities. Um, but the Soviet Union was an empire that had long outlived its time. China's growing. Uh, it, the chances that it's going to fall apart like the Soviet Union I don't think are very high. And so this is the big unanswered question in international relations. When I start my international relations class at Georgetown, I ask the students, what is the most important unanswered question in international relations today? And the answer is how the international system deals with the rise of China. Uh, and thus far, this, uh, this responsible stakeholder template, I think, is one useful way of thinking about how, um, how to do this in a way that benefits not just uh, the United States, but benefits other countries in the region that surround China.